Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the official Oscarina nomination coverage for Wing Commander 2. My name is Corbett Capon, and I'll be your host for the evening. Here with me is fellow Oscarina Mitch Kopich. Mitch, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yep, always a fun night to be nerding out with our fellow Oscarina voters. So, uh, Wing Commander 2 is a space dogfighting simulation game with a mature and epic space opera storyline. You play as Christopher Maverick Blair, a former Wing Commander who suffered a humiliating loss of position and reputation when his ship was destroyed under his watch. In parallel with this is an ongoing war with the warlike cat alien race of the Kilrathi and a deadly saboteur on board. How will Maverick manage as these conflicts weigh heavily on his soul? This is the sequel from the, to the original Wing Commander game from 1990, but tonight we'll be talking about this game from 1991, developed and published by Origin Systems. Wing Commander 2 has a total of eight nominations. They are in order, Best Pixel for 1991, Best Interface, Best Visual Immersion, Best Sound Atmosphere, Best Female Character for Jeanette, otherwise known as Angel, Best Female Character for Mariko, otherwise known as Spirit. And then we have Best Male Character for Hobbs and Best Narrative Composition. So coming up first, we have Best Visual Immersion. So you play inside of a cockpit um, with half of your screen covered and um, the top half has the space uh, and the battles and so forth. Um, so. Inside of your, uh, you know, visual cockpit, you can see each of the enemy ships, even though they're being tracked in 3D space, they appear to you as a 2D image, and the 2D image changes depending on the enemy ship orientation relative to you, the pilot. This is an extremely clever technical design because it avoids the really, like, low-poly 3D graphics, and it also happens to be uh, much easier in terms of performance, especially when you're running many different ships on screen at once. Of particularly note, um, you can actually be running through an asteroid field, which will commonly have like, you know, 30 or so asteroids all coming at you at once. And if it was rendering 3D in real time, there's no way you could handle that without slowdown. But in this case, you avoid the slowdown. And because in modern day, people like pixel art, it actually has aged pretty well as far as the appearance goes and things like that. Um, so aside from being easy on the eyes, it also ends up being reasonably clear most of the time as far as visual indicators of like, okay, yeah, that's a ship, that's an asteroid, and so forth. Um, another neat little detail as far as visual immersion goes during the battles is when you shoot enemies, they actually shoot out, send out little bits of ship debris, especially when they blow up, when you can actually see little parts of their inner guts and stuff flying all over and stuff. And um, even during the cutscenes, You'll actually see in the in the windows in the back, you can see little bits of space debris sort of reflecting the fact that this is a war zone and space is really kind of changed by all of your actions. So really helps the visual immersion there. You, you, you can see their guts? No, sorry, the guts of the ship, I meant. Oh, oh, I was like, <laughs> I didn't, did I not <laughs> notice that? No, no, no. <laughs> guts of the ship, you just see little like, you know, gear-like things and belt-like things and other things like that that are sort of, you yeah. know, coming out of the ship. Should have made that clear. Chunks um, of metal and whatever scrap. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you can also see your in-game character's joystick moving with their hand inside the cockpit. Small detail, but it really does make it feel a lot more immersive. Um, and also on the topic of visual immersion, um, tons of different parts of your ship can break. And this sort of ties into the interface, but it's also the immersion because you'll be able to see like your mm. screen, like on your ship ends up getting a bit busted. And, you know, basically as you're sitting inside the cockpit, you know, it definitely makes you feel like, you know, you're really in there when like even the methods you use to control the ship end up getting broken and stuff while you're piloting around and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, lots of cool little details in the battle interface. Um, on the cutscene side of things, so we've got. Hold on. Um, uh, did you mention? Oh, yeah. uh, did you mention the uh, planets in the backgrounds when you're flying around? Oh, actually, I didn't know if I remembered that. What well, elaborate a bit more on that? It basically, even though you're just going out into space, and you would think that, oh, I'm just out in space, and it's all the same. But throughout the campaign there's all sorts of different things you can see in the background and it's not just like in some cases you see different planets uh and they'll maintain their position like as you're flying around 
but you can also like when you have to dock your ship you have to like fly up to the ship and then as it gets gradually closer it'll eventually like take you into the cutscene but it's just a nice little touch to have those transitions from like going out into combat and then going back into it like there's the cinematic but then there's also the the process of like making the player kind of you know physically go through those steps of like okay i gotta fly in and then the ship gets bigger and then and then it goes into the cutscene so it's just this natural flow Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it sort of ties into the gameplay too and stuff like that. But like the fact that they actually like make you go through the motions of like, you know, you pull up your comms menu, you ask them to land, they approve it and you have to go to the front of the ship. You know, that whole docking sequence, while it's a bit annoying, it definitely helps you really feel like you're a pilot and stuff as far as, you know, going, you know, through the taking off and docking and everything like that. So yeah, good point there. Anything else you want to mention on the battle interface as far as visual immersion goes before I move on to the cutscenes? Uh... No, you can go ahead with cutscenes, and then I'll touch upon the interface in a little bit. Sure. So yeah, so as far as cutscenes go, so you're ending up inside of this little cockpit and whatnot, right? But every time that you take off and land at the beginning and the end of your mission, they show you a cutscene that shows your ship in complete glorious detail. And if you change ships, <laughs> that cutscene changes with it. So you really know exactly what you're piloting, which helps with the visual immersion there. The ships even look reasonably unique and they suit your play style and ability. So when you fight the big bomber, it's like three times as big as when you fight, fly inside the nimble little fighter jet that's able to dart around really quickly. Mission objectives, instead of just being like a dry bullet point list of, you know, what you're supposed to do and stuff like that, are actually conveyed in a briefing room with the commander and you've got in the background little people who are milling about and like, you know, you see them all stand up when they get to their mission and stuff like that. Um, and th that's the most common use case, but there's times where if it's really urgent, they're like, get in your ship right now, and they literally brief you on your way out through the comms channel and stuff, you know. Um, or they might potentially, you know, give you an update on your mission objective midway through your mission and stuff like that. So they yeah, find ways to keep awesome. it creative and interesting, but also definitely helps with the immersion there and stuff like that. Um, uh, as far as the how the cutscenes are conveyed, um, you don't just have like a static image of a person with text reading by. You actually have the different pilots have their faces contort and reflect their emotions and things like that, which really help them feel like real people. And it definitely helps with the cinematic touch as far as, you know, making it really feel like a movie. Um, on the topic of cinematography, they're also constantly like panning around from different creative camera angles and stuff like that. Granted, they don't use a huge variety of it because trying to save space on your hard drive. But the fact that like, for example, you can have one where, you know, there's like Jazz is like playing in the background or he's, you know, up front and personal. Or, you know, there's one, you know, brief little snippets where you see a character like walking into a cutscene or out. In particular, I like the fact that like uh, Kill Rathi, that when you hear the commanders talking, they got these big old dramatic capes that they give a dramatic flourish with when they're like, you know, <laughs> turning their faces yeah. and stuff like that. That's that's very that nice awesome. right there. Yeah, yeah, it's totally. cool that they splurged for those like the beginning of the game and the and the ending where they have these fully fledged animated cutscenes. Those were really awesome. It just oh, yeah, adds definitely. so much more like flair and pizzazz. And I feel like that was kind of missing from the first one a little bit. I, I mean, we're going to talk about this more, I think, as we get into it. But because the first game was a solid pick and it was definitely pushing a lot in terms of like technical capacity but it didn't have quite as many roots in like story. And this one, it's just all out, but it's also bringing with it that technical prowess. So it's just a really cool thing to see. Like if you're going to compare with something like, uh, like Darius Twin or UN Squadron, and like, those are, those are good games, but like you don't get anywhere near the kind of like nuanced details that you can with this, with all the different kinds of ships and the way they look and the way that you get to see them take off and, it's just it's just so much more uh, elaborate. Yeah, definitely. I mean, at the time, from what I've heard, Wing Commander 2 did require some pretty cutting edge, you know, PC hardware as far as you having to like spend a lot and find a capable machine that could run this thing. But it does seem like they really put their technical chops in the right places and whatnot. Like, you know, as far as it definitely does help with the visual immersion and like as I mean, I don't think there's anything in there that I would consider like completely superfluous. Everything seems like it helps at least a little bit to add to the experience and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yeah, that's most of the points that I had to say on the topic of visual immersion. Uh, anything else you wanted to add before we move on to our next category, Mitch, which is uh, best interface? No, I think we covered it. I can uh, launch an interface if you're ready. 
Sure, sounds good to me. So for interface, there's kind of two aspects to this. The first is going to be uh, when you're actually piloting the ships. Uh, and so one of the more interesting things about it is you've kind of already touched upon the fact that every interior of the ships are all different, um, just as their exterior is. So uh, it's a completely new layout for every ship, which is like completely unnecessary. Like you could just be a fighter pilot designated to fly a very specific kind of ship and then call it a day. But they have like, it's like a good four, I think, different ships that you fly, three or four, something like that. Uh, yeah, and then also the information on your like sort of circuit boards and everything, it's not all totally useless. Uh, for example, you'll have like the comms channel show up and you can get, like you can set up conversations with, well, you don't rather, but like the story will carry you through a conversation with your co-pilot or with base. Um, and so in between like cutscenes in and out, you have that like screen pop up and the characters talking to you directly and they're fully voiced as well, which is really cool. Um, so that adds a nice layer of connectivity. Um, it also has like these brief moments that link combat scenarios together or like if you loop around or take out a bunch of ships in order to like transition and I imagine this is probably just covering a loading screen but you'll see your ship kind of like fly across the screen and then it's kind of as a nice little brief pause to keep things moving. Um, so there's lots of nice little touches throughout the experience to just make it feel like it's just you in the ship flying around. Yep, those are all definitely solid points as far as what helps with the interface. Anything else you want to add or should I start adding in my own little spiel and stuff? Uh, if you've got stuff for the ship interior, you may as well cover that now. Uh, the rest of mine have to do with like uh, the other stuff, the other the non-combat scenarios, that is. Okay, yeah, sure. So, yeah, as far as the interface goes, um, so I would say that while the different, you know, heads-up displays are, you know, varying from ship to ship, they're also pretty reasonably good at displaying like a lot of different information on a compact little screen there and whatnot. Um, and what's especially clever about the uh, the interface is that the the top half is showing what's outside your ship. Your bottom half has got your what's inside your display. But this is also a clever technical innovation because you only have to render in terms of like graphical hardware the stuff that's on the top half of the screen. The bottom half is mostly static, so it's a lot less graphical hmm. capability. But you know, for simple stuff like you know adding in the you know mini map and the armor and the shields and stuff like that, that's no big deal for for uh, technical capability. Um, and yeah, hmm. I think that hmm. for me on the heads-up display, one feature I especially liked was the little mini-map type of deal and whatnot, where basically you can see uh, relative orientation of like, okay, well, there's a baddie in to the right or left or up or down of you and whatnot, but it doesn't it doesn't tell you how close they are per se, but it does tell you the approximate direction. And that's the real important thing that you need to know because you want to know, okay, how do I turn to like reach the guy in order to like nail him? Or, okay, where's my ally at? Who's like usually indicated by a blue dot. Um, so that I can track him down and help him out if he's like under fire and stuff like that. So only a small number of pixels on there, but it really helps as far as, uh, you know, getting the important information there and whatnot. Um, as far as tracking down enemy ships, um, so when you're near an enemy ship, there'll usually be like little red corners to designate that, yeah, you got an enemy ship, which is nice because like sometimes if they're far away or things like that, it might be a little harder to distinguish from like a star or things like that. And that also helps to distinguish it from like an, an ally ship, who I believe has no outline or maybe a blue outline. Plus, you can also lock onto them when you got shield uh, missiles or things like that, and that'll make it so that you got a solid red box around them. And it'll make sure that you can keep on hammering at one particular enemy until they're dead, so that when they pull out of your line of sight, you're not going to just all of a sudden, you know, forget who it is you were fighting and have to fight someone who's at full health and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, Oh, yeah, as far as control scheme goes, uh, Wing Commander's best control scheme, as evidenced by most of the players, is to use an actual flight Joy-Con. So for maximum immersion, <laughs> this thing is actually designed best for a joystick that's really that's like a awesome. fighter-style joystick, right? So that's great, <laughs> but for the people who don't have a bajillion dollars to spend, you know, like, oh, their poor parents only gave them like a thousand dollars for Christmas <laughs> or whatnot, um, they have backup control schemes for both, joy or for both keyboard and mouse, which, while they don't work quite as good as a dedicated flight joystick, they still work reasonably well. I mean, on the Wing Commander 2 forums, when asked which is a better backup control scheme, people are pretty split. So it's like both of them seem to work reasonably good for people. Um, although 
I personally prefer the keyboard, uh, the keyboard, but that's just my own personal preference. Um, I actually have a um, one of those uh, flight simulation sticks, but it was technically for the NES, and oh. yeah, it was this weird, like one of those strange NES accessories. Uh, Nintendo, I think, has always been about that. It's just what kind of <laughs> a strange accessories can we throw in here? And I remember I it didn't think, like, work. What could any... even run on the NES as far as flight simulation capability? Like asteroids? Like nothing. I can't think of very much. Nothing <laughs> ran on <in> it. <laughs> or at least none of the games oh. I had. It was one of like I also had. Um, there was like a external port to have like five or six players, I think, or something like that for the Super Nintendo. That didn't work either. Or at least like. You know, we had these accessories and they probably only worked with very, 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 very specific games. And like, you know, my dad's decently techy, but I don't know if he was techy enough to like really tell. So he's probably like, oh, OK, well, this would make sense. Like I have you know, we you know, we have a couple of flight flight simulator kind of games, so it's got to work with one of these. Like we had Top Gun on NES, so you would have thought it would have worked with that. It could have just been that it was busted, but uh yeah, thing didn't work at all, but it was nifty to pretend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unrelated to our discussion, but one of the hilarious things that comes up on the Smash Bros subreddit from time to time is people who bring in the most ludicrous GameCube <laughs> controllers that Nintendo has put out to tournaments in order to try and beat people with just these utter monstrosities of like uncontrollability that were maybe designed for like one game and then forgotten about and stuff. So yeah, Nintendo and their accessories, man. <laughs> Yeah. Like I said, it was fun to imagine, like, you could get a sibling to play, uh, like, Top Gun, and then you could use the analog stick. Or oh, yeah, that's true, actually. To pretend. See, that's what it's really important for, is for little brother mode, where you can give your yes. brother a more convincing controller, so he'll more likely believe he's actually helping you when he's actually doing <laughs> nothing, right? Exactly. <laughs> um... Okay, yeah, so just uh, going through the other points I've got down here for interface. Um, yeah, go for so it. So this is a carryover from Wing Commander 1, which did it slightly better, but Wing Commander 2 still has it. The main menu is actually the ship's lobby, where you can actually, like, you're looking yeah. in a room, like adventure mode style and whatnot, mm -hmm. and you go out to the hangar if you want to fly a mission, and you go to the computer if you want to type in the save menu, and then your save menu is on an old-style computer, which you're, you know, typing in just like someone in the universe would and stuff, so... Even their menus, they're really going the extra mile to make it cinematic and immersive and stuff like that. Um, yeah, agreed. That's a really nice touch. Well, and also, yep. too, when you're interacting with, you know, the other characters. So you're usually in first person for most of the game, except when you're in a cutscene. Uh, but that works. It's honestly kind of like, I think uh, we had a friend of mine mentioning, he's like, oh, this seems like, you know, a predecessor to like a Mass Effect type of scenario. Or like a Halo or something like that, and it, and it really is because it's a big epic story. Um, it's a first person perspective where all the shooting action happens, uh, but then you get the the story moments, and for those it pulls back so that way you can actually see your character and you can actually get a sense for the scope of the story, and that I think works a lot better. It's kind of cool to see a game this dated do something like that as opposed to just getting locked into the position of well everything's got to be from first person because that's the perspective you're in like there is room for that and there's definitely some games that do it well but i also think when you have your story as such a big focus that knowing that hey we need to like give this these sequences some room to breathe and to convey them in a way that's going to help sell the story and get people emotionally connected with it and so i think that was a nice choice on their part Yep, for sure, for sure. Um, so yeah, just a couple other quick things to wrap up the, the interface discussion. So the thing I would say that hold like the interface is a mixed bag and whatnot is the fact that so this actually had a relatively like simplified interface compared to other flight sims at the time, which were truly unwieldy. But looking at it from a modern point of view, there are still a lot of buttons to memorize. You gotta have one like a lot of them are honestly unnecessary and whatnot. Like you have buttons, mm. dedicated buttons to like look sideways in your ship, which you're probably never gonna do and stuff like that. Um, but like, you know, even if you're just talking about the bare minimum, you got the, you know, tilting your angle, increasing and decreasing your speed, your afterburners, your comms menu, and then a bunch of different buttons to switch your heads up displays and whatnot. So the thing is that you have to figure out which ones are necessary or not. And for the ones that are necessary, it's still a lot to memorize. But once you memorize them all, because they're all dedicated buttons, it makes it so that if you're inside of a battle and really in the thick of it, 
with a single button press, you can switch to the thing that you really need to know and whatnot. So mm. if you do end up learning it, it can be for pretty rewarding as far as being able to expertly weave between different options while you're in the middle of battle, which is, you know, so pros and cons, I would say, as far as the interface goes on complexity. Yeah, for sure. Also, just one, this is a pretty minor thing, but one other thing that's just really cool about the interface, probably shouldn't matter that much as far as overall merit goes, but along with the comms channel having the very necessary functions of being able to tell your allies to stay close to you or to break off an attack, you can actually also communicate with your enemies and you can send taunts <laughs> to your enemies, specifically degrading taunts like, you know, oh, yeah. you know, uh, want to treat for ball or things like that. And uh, they'll send back some <laughs> retort towards you, but just a really fun little detail that they took the time to program in, which honestly not that yeah. useful, but just very, very fun little tidbit right there. Yeah, well, it's fantastic too when they like reply back and they're just like, die human scum. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that one's kind of, I think that also kind of breaches into visual immersion territory because it's one of those things where it's just the whole scenario has come alive, this dog fight that you're in, right? Yep, for sure. Okay, well, I think that's about all I have to say on the interface. Do you have anything else you want to mention before we move on to sound atmosphere? Uh, no, yeah, we've spent, I think, quite a long time on the visual department. So yeah, let's go ahead and move on. Yeah. Sure. And I would say that we did spend a long time, but I do feel like that is one of Wing Commander's strengths. They really put a lot of effort into, like, you know, making that interface and the immersion real good. But, but oh, yeah, agree. go ahead. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, let's uh, move on. So next, as far as sound atmosphere. Um, so I would say that the sound effects are reasonably good, but not, like, incredibly amazing. But as far as some of the noteworthy, like, I think that they could have had more impact or been a bit more iconic. But as far as some of the sound effects that help out with uh, when you're in cutscenes or battles or things like that, um, there's a very dramatic like zoom every noise every time that somebody like just barely scrapes by on your you know on your dogfight, which will happen yeah. quite frequently as you're all you know darting in between a bunch of enemy fighters and stuff. Um, there's a reasonably satisfying explosion that happens when an enemy ship blows up and you got afterburners with your racking around and stuff like that, um, along with indicators of you getting hit. But I would say that uh, for me, where sound atmosphere is really carried by Wing Commander 2 is the addition of digital voice. So at least from what I've heard, listening to other visual uh, video essays on the topic, uh, Wing Commander 2 was one of the first games that really incorporated digital voice, you know, significantly in the course of its, um, of its uh, gameplay. And this digital voices actually came through fairly well because along with the cutting edge processors at the time, uh, Wing Commander 2 was relying on the Sound Blaster card, which was also one of the latest and greatest as far as uh, sound capabilities go. Now, I will say that like overall Wing Commander 2 doesn't have a lot of voice acting. It's got cutscene. it's got cutscenes at the beginning and the end, and I think possibly some other noteworthy ones that are voiced. Um, but the place where the voice mm -hmm. uh, acting really comes in is during the battles where you're your allies and your um, enemy dogfighters will say little quips to you during um, during your battles and whatnot. And I would definitely say that that really helps to, you know, aid with the atmosphere as far as making it feel like a tense battle when your allies like asking you for help and things like that. Um, or when, or just really satisfying when you blow up the, uh, you know, when, when the, you fly into battle and they're like, you cannot defeat the Drakai! And then you blow them up like, <laughs> Oh, like, oh, that never gets old. Great for, uh, yeah. for feeling very satisfying as far as uh, um, the battles go. Um, but yeah, so I would say that that definitely helps with immersion, but also just helps to set the atmosphere as far as making you feel it, like a, um, you know, capable uh, pilot in the realm of the um, of this mm -hmm. war that's ongoing. Do you have anything else you want to add there and stuff, Mitch? Yeah, I do, actually. This is a, a bit of a, I don't know, somewhat of an obtuse point, maybe. But um, one of the things it does is in all the downtime, like when you're just chatting with your fellow pilots or you're meeting with like a colonel or something like that, you're doing a, a report um, and all that, the sound is just zilch. It's cut down completely and it just plays music. But what that enables it to do is create a kind of friendly atmosphere that becomes more routine it almost uh, it starts to feel like a tv show where tv shows uh, once you find one that you get kind of attached to you like to put it on even if you're not paying attention to it so much just because you like the kind of energy and the familiarity that it's going to bring i found that a similar sensation is created in this game 
when you're going through each of the different uh, story bits because it just goes back to like the same music and so it kind of and it's the same setting the same room uh, it might be different characters in it but for the most part it kind of stabilizes all of that so i imagine they would have probably even liked to have had some kind of ambient noise or if they experimented with it and found that it would have been distracting because if you're in a spaceship you know a lot of time it's just like it's some kind of like weird like humming noise in the background which uh we're talking 1991 here that probably wouldn't have sounded great but i think it was best choice to just go with music in that department and the music too is also not very overbearing it's pretty subdued and laid back for the most part when you're in those sequences um there's even those jazz compositions when everybody's just relaxing and and that works really well for it as well so it's just kind of a nice choice of how they used it but there's also just great sound effects like when you're transitioning between in like those cinematics like the ship landing and then the like the hood coming up and it's like oh like yeah all that, yeah, all that good stuff great. yep yeah so it's just kind of like you get a big so you're in a dog fight and it's just there's sounds everywhere and then all this stuff going on and then you're prepared for landing and then and then everything quiets down and then you get the story and you're just in a place where you can just fully absorb that story before you go back at it so it's not uh it avoids the problem that comes up with some modern shooting games like i know i think destiny gets this one thrown at it quite a bit where it's just after a while it just feels like this nauseating grind of just constantly because you basically don't do anything else but just constant firefights um so yeah i just thought it was a nice way to kind of smooth out the experience yeah for sure for sure all right well then do you want to lead us off with best narrative composition then mitch oh uh jumping into the heavy hitter yeah yeah we can do that i was thought we'd touch on the characters but uh i could do oh narrative comp first. i see for me, I was thinking that it would be good to... I At least I had a like uh, spoiler-free summary of the narrative, so I was thinking we could start with that and then go in-depth on the spoilers for the characters because then we can sort of talk about how the characters like fit into the overarching story and whatnot because that sort of helps to define who they are as people a little bit. Yeah, I think most of my comments are going to be classified under uh, spoiler territory for characters and narratives. So if you've got some spoiler-free stuff, maybe kind of unpack that so that way everybody has a chance to just get a sense of it and if they are intending to play it and they haven't yet they have a chance to yeah. go do that sure sure okay sounds good um so yeah so on best narrative composition uh as far as the story goes uh you know it tells the story of christopher maverick blair who's a middle-aged disgraced ace pilot who's coping with his disgraced status and striving to regain it again on his journey he will encounter other pilots with their own struggles become embroiled in a war effort and become entangled in the politics of a ship with a deadly saboteur on board. Um, so the game features twists, turns, intrigue, and tragedy as characters may or may not die and crew try to figure out who is the saboteur while also trying to manage a war effort at the same time. Um, what I really like about the narrative is that the game is perfectly content to let Blair stew in his disgraced status for the large majority of the game, which allows the nuances and ramifications of it to really be examined through the story. I mean, in less capable narrative, you know, this would just be like a, a setback that the clue of the narrative, well, once the hero just shows how much he's a good guy, then it'll just fix everything. But nope, this yeah. game, even though he's a mm -hmm. good pilot, you know, guess what? That doesn't fix everything. He's going to have to really stew in that disgrace status for the large majority of the game and whatnot. Yeah, um, they really let him have it. Like his other pilots make fun of him. Like, uh, you know, they're constantly finding ways that they can jab at him and his superiors are routinely upset with him about it and constantly suspicious and it's throughout the whole game. Uh, so yeah, it almost has, it kind of reminds me of like 24 kind of thing where it's just like you can't get the good guys to just recognize that you're on the right, you're on the same side. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I like that too. I like that it kind of stood there and it almost, because I mean, the whole game is a war story, right? And so there's this war going on and they have these moments where it slows down and characters are ruminating on the difficulties of being stuck in this situation and having to just kind of press on with what they have. And meanwhile, a Maverick situation is just all the worse for it because he's got this tarnished reputation. And it wasn't his fault, it was just something out of his out of his hands, but nevertheless, uh, the flight recorder doesn't show out show up what they want it to sit show, so uh, he has to kind of carry that burden. So yeah, I, I agree. It it makes it for a very brooding, kind of almost depressing atmosphere, but 
I thought it was handled really well, and I, I think I found myself getting really, really invested in it. I thought they did a nice job. Yeah, totally. And I mean, it's also like, this is like a military story and whatnot. You're expecting to be a bunch of like stoic, tough guys just doing stoic, tough guy things and whatnot. But but yeah, no, I mean, you definitely yeah. see how this is like taking a toll on these people emotionally. And yeah, it's not easy mm -hmm. dealing with these situations and stuff like that. So you get all these feelings and stuff, which really helps to, you know, make it a great narrative, all things considered, in my opinion. Yeah, and it, and it's subtle too, right? Because there's some characters like everybody just behaves in the way that's uh, befitting of their character, how they would on an ordinary Tuesday, and they just maintain that course throughout. And then throughout their conversations, they're just prompted with more situations of like, oh, like someone dies, and then this is a tragedy, and then character have, are having to bear that burden, and so then they kind of just they're quiet for a while. Where you have other characters like uh, who was the one who goes to visit you for a brief time he was like is the the scotsman uh, oh who's right like, yeah he's great uh that was uh paladin uh yeah paladin yeah yeah because he's always jovial and he's always like has a you know a, a optimistic attitude about things but um he's kind of like a breath of fresh air when he shows up into the scene because you're like oh man we've actually been struggling for a while we haven't had like a lighter moment and so he comes in right at a convenient opportunity to kind of lift that so it's very well we're very well balanced in that that regard yep and yeah i would say that in general the cast of characters are mature realistic and they come from a variety of different genders races and cultures which is really refreshing i mean you get lots of different you know ethnicities lots of female characters as evidenced by the fact that we got two on our list and uh yeah, yeah it just makes for a very nice and well-rounded cast as far as getting to see all these different people of different backgrounds bouncing off each other and stuff well and one of the i i don't think this is too much of a spoiler either it's is one of the kind of main themes in the game is the people in the war are having to struggle with their loyalties and they're having their allegiances challenged because they're seeing the horrifying effects of the war and their superiors are making them like go and participate in it but if that gets to be too extreme then it's like their moral conscience comes into play um and then as it's in some effort to kind of stop that they're lashing out in different ways and it's usually in the form of like switching sides or something like that but um you get to see a couple different examples of it too which i really love so it's not just like uh, one character on like the human side betrays them or vice versa it's like you have both uh, people switching and they have different reasons and they have a very different emotional arc for how they handle that. Um, and I thought that was that was really fantastic because it grounds you with all of those characters who are in the dogfights, who are actually enacting the uh, effects of war as opposed to people who are just giving commands from a chair. So yeah, I, I thought that was a really nice touch of touch of humanity. Yeah, for sure. I would say that like overall, like I would say that like the the characters, I wouldn't say they have anything quite as like, well, some of them have semblance of as an arc, but even if they don't have something that's a complete and clean and tidy as an arc, you can definitely see through the interactions, like the ways that the, you know, effects of the storyline actually sort of influence their moods and their emotions and yeah, change them as people sometimes, which definitely helps make a more compelling story and helps the characters feel more, you know, grounded and interesting and realistic and stuff. So yeah. Definitely, along with the overarching story, it's helped by having a nice, well-rounded cast of characters. Um, but yeah, that's about all I have to say as far as the spoiler-free narrative stuff. So, Mitch, if you want, you can uh, give us some spoilery stuff for a few well, minutes, and then I was going to say, why don't why don't we uh, just kind of launch into the characters now, and then we'll kind of loop back onto narrative composition to kind of sure. put a bow on it before we head into best pixel. What do you say? Yeah, sure, that sounds good. So then in that case, am I okay to give my spoiler-free character spiels to just summarize up the, the different characters we have nominated? Um, yeah, so just briefly, um, the characters that are nominated, we have uh, Hobbs for best male character. Hobbs is the uh, Kilrathi character who actually is a traitor to his own people, and he's actually joined forces with humans. And so he's one of those characters who has a really measured and level-headed perspective about the situation and he's uh he's really kind he's surprisingly like wise and mild-mannered despite being in a group of a bunch of people who 
are, are all different than him in a significant way and are all very distrusting of him. Um, but I'll let you kind of go into the deeper reason. So I'm just going to give you an overview to each of the characters. So that's Hobbs. He's a really cool character. Uh, Jeanette is uh, our female nomination. Uh, she is the colonel of the situation and she was a fighter pilot with the cast from the first game and she's been since promoted. And so she has to walk this really interesting balance of having to be their superiors and so she can't always just you know go hang out and have drinks with them or just take their word for it anymore and be like oh yeah i got your back there's a number of places where she's like look i'm trying to help you but also I i'm in between like different ranks now and i have to do things honestly and i have to do things in such a way that ensures that people see and respect me as their leader so you're gonna have to just kind of handle this on your own accord and and she's just a really really strong presence i like her character a lot because she's just super believable she feels like a real person she's she's like maybe a bit stoic and a bit militaristic but it's like she has to be and there's all these like small hints of occasionally where she's like look like you have to understand my situation it's not that simple i can't just always i just i, I can't go and take care of my feelings all the time i have to be on duty and that's what we're here to do and you should be doing the same um so yeah, she's she's up there as well. And then we also have uh, Mariko. And I'll tell you what, why don't you go ahead and lead the talk on Mariko. And then when you're ready, you, you take off the, the spoiler curtain and then we'll dive in. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, so I guess uh, just what I have for the spoiler-free summary on Mariko is I just said she's a polite and kind returning friend from the first game. Uh, she has some difficult struggles that she's trying to figure out on her own. And the question is, will Maverick be able to break down her barriers and support her in her time of need when he himself has so much to deal with? Um, I would say Spirit is especially, uh, you know, refreshing for Maverick because, like, he's in a ship of a lot of unfamiliar faces, most of whom are particularly unfriendly and whatnot, and Spirit is just, yeah. like, somebody who he can actually rely on and, you know, have some, you know, nice relations with for a change and stuff, and it makes her own, you know, difficult struggles all the more difficult to manage and, you know... So, yeah, that's about all I can say in a spoiler-free direction. So, uh, do you want to go ahead yeah, and kick off Yeah, she doesn't the... hold him uh, responsible for the, the Tiger's Claw situation, which is what's put Maverick in this uh, untrustworthy state, as it were. Yeah. Uh, all right, yeah, so I, I, that, I think that's it for spoiler-free section. So, uh, we're going to go full spoilers now in uh, all three of the characters. And, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll let you take it away. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I would say that uh, for relevant spoilers on Hobbs, so Hobbs ends up helping Blair keep flying even when everyone else wants to ground him. Uh, he defends Blair as a trustworthy, honorable, and effective pilot, uh, and through his interactions with Blair, he basically causes Blair to change his mind on the Kilrathi race, where mm -hmm. Blair had previously been of the opinion that they're all, you know, just a bunch of scum and there's nothing we can really do but like, you know, defeat them militarily he actually yeah. starts to open his mind a little bit and think well maybe we got a chance for peace or you know maybe you know their minds can be changed it's particularly noteworthy and the thing is that it's especially noteworthy because christopher probably wouldn't have been able to have these pivotal character moment changes if he wasn't under this you know really stressful situation where very few friends around his reputation is disgraced and all of a sudden now he starts bonding with this fellow outcast and you know ending up forging a good relationship with them and stuff like that so you know uh, he ends up being a very, you know, interesting character for, you know, Maverick's character change, but also just an incredibly, you know, wonderful breath of fresh air in his own right as far as just, you know, being the utmost moral paragon and stuff like that. And I mean, it makes sense with his background because, I mean, if you're in a race that, if, if you have to, like, make the decision of, like, considering a whole race, you know, like or at least your, your military government just, like, super abhorrent to the point where you would betray them it's like you got to have some pretty strong moral convictions and that's totally reflective yeah. in his character um well yeah because even when you know they're having this discussion and uh hobbs is like oh I, I i don't hold you responsible for what happened at the tiger tiger's claw i know your record is it's proven itself and that's what i'm going by and your reputation like among my people was very clear even before that event and it's interesting that he was someone who looked at that situation and was like, eh, no, that's, everybody's being real dismissive of that. It doesn't make any sense. Like, you have to look at the whole picture, which again goes back to his, his sort of wise ethos where he's just, 
very level headed in that regard. Um, and I, I think it's cool because this character is doing a lot more than just he probably even realizes just by being like a chill fellow. He goes over and breaks down all these barriers that, you know, all these prejudices that humanity has against their species. I mean, they've been at war with them for years and they've had so few interactions. Most of your interactions is just like, you know, like you said, take this for a ball or <laughs> like gunning them down in space. And so having him like on board their ship walking around and then a bunch of characters being like, ooh, I don't know about this. And then some other ones being like, well, give him a chance. Like, yeah, I thought the same, but after a while, like you get to know him and then he proves himself over and over again, like he's on our side and it goes to show like where the true values are. It's not necessarily just about, you know, your country or your government or your species. It really is about just finding a common sense of humanity. Yeah, very well put. I would also note, like for me at least, like, my favorite character moment for him that's both defining for him as character but also just freaking cool is the fact that like he there's one sequence early on in wing commander where like another i think stingray he calls like hob some derogatory comment and whatnot and like mm -hmm. he basically instead of just like coming to fisticuffs when stingray is clearly asking for it he actually tries to de-escalate the situation he's like hey you know what it's late why don't we all like get to bed and call it a night but then when stingray says Maverick is a traitor. He's like, you know what? We have a way of decide uh, of dealing with people who make false accusations on my planet. And then he beats the crap out of him while you're on a flight. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is a guy who would not go to fisticuffs for his own honor, but would for you. It's like, what a freaking bro. Like, I can't think of that many other people who would do that kind of thing. But yeah. Yeah, he's awesome. I love Hobbs. Mm -hmm. And he, he comes onto the scene and just completely changes the narrative. Like, he totally shifts it. At first, you're just like, all right, space action, space opera stuff. All right, it's all right. It's going okay. And then he comes onto the scene and you're like, whoa, this adds a whole nother dimension to the whole story. Uh, to go back to kind of the sort of early example of like a Mass Effect or a Halo thing, it's kind of like an Arbiter situation where, you know, he's he leaves. I mean, he hit different circumstances, different details, and, you know, we don't want to get into that but it is just interesting to see that kind of complexity and like how important or, or how big of an impact your story can have just by pulling a character who's just been a com in a completely different environment and throwing them in another one and having them just be a, be a total boss for sure all right well anything else you want to mention on Hobbs before we move on to the next character nah I mean Hobbs is great yep you, you should vote for him <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So up next, I think we should talk about Spirit before we talk uh, about Jeanette and whatnot, if that's okay with sure. you, because I figured yeah. Spirit will tie into Jeanette. So do you want to talk about Spirit first? I forget who's uh, up for that one. Or is uh, that that should department? probably be you. Um, okay. I mean, I like Spirit, but I'm going to kind of bounce off of you a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Okay. So as far as Spirit goes, so for relevant spoilers, which definitely a lot more central to her character and whatnot. So. Yeah. Spirit is sad at the beginning of the game because she's missing her kidnapped and enslaved fiance, which actually happens during the course of Wing Commander 1, uh, one of the secret missions. Um, midway through the game, a traitor claims he has her fiance alive and will provide him if Spirit helps in sabotaging her ship. Uh, she suffers her predicament in silence for a while and then eventually refuses. When the slave ship is found and rescue is deemed impossible, she even volunteers to help with the mission that is expected to end in, this, in the slave ship's destruction. When her ship is failing mid-mission, she crashes her ship into the slave ship, destroying them both. In the aftermath, one of your co-pilots suspects this was somewhat intentional, as Spirit had lost her will to go on due to her sadness about her fiancé. And my next bullet point I have after that is just, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty brutal. Uh, yeah, I mean, I already felt bad for her, like, before she had this predicament, particularly since, as I mentioned previously, she's, like, one of your sh few shipmates who are nice to you when your other shipmates are being a bunch of jerks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I especially like how this, uh, her, her internal struggle, it plays out as a slow burn over multiple missions where yeah. you don't, her, her, like, what the deal is with her is slowly unraveled bit by bit, and you can see it gradually taking in more and more of a toll on her mental state and whatnot, where she just gets more and more depressed as you're talking to her, which very well done in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, um, like Maverick was as supportive as he could be 
spirit made all the right decisions and then it still ended in her dying it was just such an impossibly difficult situation there wasn't really any yeah. good solutions for it and in my opinion it really grounds it as like a war story because a lot of times you can you know in the words of captain picard do all the right things and still lose and you know yeah. where it just uh you know and it kind of acts as really a bit of a disempowerment for the player in the first game yeah it's like you're just the ace of ace pilots and you're basically single-handedly winning a war for yourself in this one <laughs> you know what you can blow up all the people you want but it's not going to save necessarily your close ones from getting killed and you know you can be yeah. an ace pilot and it doesn't solve everything you know um mm -hmm. so yeah that's most of my gist on the angel i would say though like it's or i mean on spirit, spirit uh, yeah. i would say a mild um negative and it's not really a big deal or anything like that I don't know if it's like mildly problematic or stereotypical that like spirit's the only japanese person on board and she kamikazes her ship it's probably not a big deal but you know just something worth bringing up as far as that you know mild nitpick i guess um but yeah i don't know yeah that's about all i have for it what do you have to say about her mitch if anything else yeah i uh, i don't know that that one didn't that element of it i guess didn't bother me that much like i once you brought it up i was like oh yeah that makes sense but I don't know. I think I think her tor story is just told so sincerely. And and the other thing too that I would add is like there's the lead up to this situation because she does confide this information with Maverick, which she doesn't have to do. Um, but then when she tells him, he's like, "Well, we have to tell somebody. Like, we can't. We have to like change the mission parameters. Like, we can't just go and end his life. We have to save him." And she's like, "No, don't tell anybody." And he's like, "What do you mean?" And she's like, "Look, if you're my friend, you have to not say anything." And he has the opportunity to do so and doesn't take it. And uh, it's it's kind of just this, I don't know, it makes the story, it's kind of has a poetic, I guess, justice is the term I'm looking for. Um, the fact that he kind of lets her handle it in the way that she wants to. And her solution is she's like broken up over the fact that she thought he was dead, but now he's back alive. And now he's basically just being tortured. And she's like, all right, well, we can't have that. So the best thing I can do is just end the situation. So I, I, I didn't really see her so much as like uh, happy that she was going to die. And just more like she looked at the situation and was like, well, I just have to end this whole situation for him because there's no way to save him. And I care about him too much to see him suffer. So it has to just be the end result. And, and kind of if she's dying along in the process, you know, I'm sure she wasn't complaining about that outcome. But it was the kind of thing where, I don't know, I didn't see her as going for it just because she wanted to end the pain. It was like, it was still noble, right? Like, because she could have just gone and offed herself immediately. But it wasn't like that. She was like, well, I have to solve this situation. And yeah, I'm no, a soldier. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like, uh, you know, the, the, the reason why I brought up is I think that in the aftermath of that, there's, like, just a uh, one of the other um, crewmates and whatnot just makes a brief aside that she was not really, you know as thrilled about you know going on after all this stuff had happened so maybe she wasn't mm. quite as opposed to the fact but yeah i wouldn't say that she was like doing it that deliberately she only committed to it once it was like okay you know what i'm my ship's going down i'm probably not making it out of this one of those things where it's like you know wouldn't go out of her way to kill herself but it sounds like she wasn't really gonna try like go out of her way to super... save herself either yeah yeah exactly which mm -hmm. geez that just sucks you know yeah that makes it all the more heartbreaking so yeah, I, she's a really good character. It's just a really heartbreaking narrative that you have to follow through with her. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a good one. It definitely hits home. Um, and I, I really liked Maverick's response too, like because he's totally her friend. And that was actually something you had brought up before in earlier conversations about how, you know, she's there, but it's not she's she's not there to be a love interest for your character. It's like no, they're legitimately just friends and they're co-pilots, and that's all it is. And it's cool to see them just operate in that function when it just seems like every time you're going to have like your lead character, you got to make give them a love interest and then everything circles around that. So it's just refreshing that they kind of they change it up and they have something something different to offer, something that was more realistic, too, because she had already been, you know, engaged for a while. And, you know, it, it wasn't like there was not really a spark of attraction between the two of them. They were just friends, like, because they went to flight school together. It's like, it's pretty easy to see that connection, right? Yep. I would also say, I don't know if this is for sure one of the contributing factors. You got these really well-written female characters, and uh, it just so happens that for the writers, they had a, a guy and a girl, I think possibly husband and wife, actually, uh, Ellen and Stephen Beeman. And Ellen hmm. happens to be 
a writer for television and books uh, and other video games before she was brought on for Wing Commander, you know? So, so they got some good author chops on there on board and, you know, that might have helped with uh, writing the female characters potentially. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, doesn't, well, I was about to say it doesn't hurt, but I have played some games where hiring a, a book author does, in fact, <laughs> oh. <laughs> what you're trying to accomplish. I, I take that back. Um, but yeah, in this case, uh, it was definitely the right call. And they, they definitely, yeah, it just, the, the, and this is something we, I wanted to kind of touch upon just at some point in here is that, you know, Wing Commander 1 was an option here as well, but I mean, Wing Commander 2 just blows the other one out of the water. Like, it, it's, yeah. it's just crazy. The level of story, character, and depth that's put into the world and just everything. It's its on a completely new level. And it, it it's very much... It's like the one game on this list that feels ahead of its time in terms of just raw technical prowess and just complete uh, complete grit. Because it, it's demonstrating things that like, oh, wow, you could have this simulated experience that's so... You know that's mimicking so many aspects of like a good drama in so many ways so and you got to yeah. keep in mind that like this is the same year that like final fantasy 4 had come out and like prior to that it's like you got like your super mario worlds and like you got your mm -hmm. you know your dragon quest 4s but like storytelling in most other games of the time was like very rudimentary compared to this. Oh, granted we have some other very solid picks for narrative that we've got nominated to and stuff like that but you know i'm just saying for all of our nominated picks for narrative they stand out all the more so because in this era like video games as a storytelling medium still had like a lot of you know not as frequent in terms of the really good storytelling chops and stuff i would say and whatnot. yeah and and also too those other ones are like games that are story focused like this game doesn't need to be because that's what the original was it didn't have a strong story it was just kind of like oh there's some story beats but for the most part go out and do some dog fighting and so the fact that they put in all this extra work to be like no 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 no, no. like part of the appeal of wing commander 2 is going to be its engaging narrative so yeah it's really yeah. cool mm -hmm. well let's cover jeanette yeah. real quick um sure uh, did you uh, okay, so uh <clears throat> go ahead sure do you uh, do you want me to give just a relevant spoiler summary of uh, of Angel before you get into the what makes her great, or do you want to summarize that? Uh, no, yeah, you go for it. Yeah. Okay, sure. So so this is actually a bit of a tie-in from Wing Commander 1, but in Wing Commander 1, uh, she was actually an analytical crewmate who would try and frequently cope with her difficult emotions with analysis and sticking to the rules. She would frequently criticize her other teammates for trying to do things their own way and get killed potentially as a result. And as we've seen in the second game, that's promoted her to commander, but it all the more makes her struggles even more the parent where, you know, she's just dealing with these really difficult situations, trying to keep everyone on board while she's trying to like, you know, manage it with all this careful analysis and stuff. So anyways, as the storyline of Wing Commander 2 unfolds, um, she is clearly stressed about her job and she constantly worries about how to handle the safety of her crew and ship along with accomplishing her mission objectives, you know, and you know, those are oftentimes very difficult to handle. Um, and when Spirit happened to be a very close friend of both Angels and of uh, the main character Maverick and whatnot, you know, definitely passes the uh, Beckman test where you got, you know, situations <laughs> with Angel and uh, I think it's what it's called. You know, Angel and Spirit are, you know, interacting with each other yeah. about stuff that's not just men and stuff. So, you know, and uh, and when Spirit dies, uh, Spirit's loss pushes Maverick and Angel further towards the breaking point, yet they do not not break under the immense struggle and instead emerge even stronger with the power of love so yeah angel is a love interest in the game and it's pretty cool so yeah you can you can go ahead now mitch uh yeah yeah i think i think that covers it pretty well um yeah and even even when she becomes a love interest like i don't know it's almost like like her job really does come first and <laughs> it's just kind of interesting how she didn't like like their interactions didn't change that much. Like they were just, they, they would like finish a report, but then Maverick was like, so like, how are you doing? Or do you want to go out and have some drinks? And then she's like, look Maverick, I got a ton of stuff to do. And it was like, okay. So yeah, the, the romance thing, I don't know. I, I didn't see the romance as like, but maybe that's because they didn't push it. I was about to say, I didn't see it as like particularly impactful, but um, cause it, it's like, there's the initiation and then there's like a couple of exchanges and then, of course, you have the kiss at the end. It almost seems like it was just for that kiss. So that way, like when everything's all said and done uh, and this is kind of getting into the narrative resolution. But like uh, this final spoiler for that is uh, uh, Maverick does, in fact, like save the day. And in a big way, he has to disobey orders and go out and just completely be a total badass. And, and that's how he's able to kind of prove his name and 
sort of clear it at the very, very end of the game. So the payoff yeah. to all of that is, you know, saves the day, gets the girl, etc. Actually, though, I would say that the uh, the final conclusion there actually has a lot more spice when you know about the the bad end and whatnot, where Ooh, it turns yeah. out when he does, yeah, when he does put it all on the line and he says he's going to disobey orders, if you eject and you fail that mission, it has a whole sequence where it talks about how he's like extra super disgraced now and he doesn't even get to stay together with his girlfriend he has to go to like this super crummy post out in the middle of nowhere probably for the rest of his life and it's like oh man so like you have that background it really makes the victory at the end stand out a lot more when you know this is what he had on the line by like disobeying orders and just going for it that hard and stuff well yeah they treat it like a mi real military and that's like kind of the main crux with uh with angel as well it's just the fact that she like you said, she's by the book, and so she has to play everything by the book, and she continues to do that the whole time. And you can tell, like, she's a real person. There's a nice... It's almost like, um... I don't know. She's, like, the one character who... It, it felt like there was an, a live actress playing her at times, where she's trying to convey this nuance of being a real person and letting that slip through just so that you could see it and identify that it was there, and then, like, not do anything else with it, just to go back to being like, hey, I'm the colonel, and you're going to treat me as such. So, yeah, I, I really liked her character. I just found her to be super convincing. And it was kind of cool to have uh, her if someone that you knew from the first game reemerge as like your superior. And it also was really important for her to be there because if it wasn't her, then nobody would have given Maverick any flack. They wouldn't have let him fly or they would have made him do stupid patrol missions. Like, it's only the fact that she's there that you can believably have that happen because you know, to her superior, she's like, well, he's one of my pilots, I'm supposed to use him, right? And then they'd be like, oh, yeah, I guess so. Um, but if it was somebody else, you know, they would try to, they they wouldn't use his skills to the test, and so you'd have to do a bunch of boring, like, patrol missions. Yep, yep, for sure. Um, I would also say that, like, um, there's a lot of times where, like, you know, Jeanette, she ends up, like, you know, not being able to help Maverick in his position because she's got a lot of other responsibilities and higher-ups mm. and stuff. And I really appreciate that Maverick is actually fairly understanding of the situation, which shows he's like a mature person yeah. and stuff, and he doesn't get all petty and, you know, oh, no, you should totally quit, you know, ruin your job just so you can save me and stuff like that. Um, and in general, it sort of highlights the fact that, like, um, while Maverick and Angel are supportive of each other, it doesn't eliminate their own struggles. They ha they are supportive yeah. of each other, but at the same time, they got their own crutches that they have to sort out, and it's not like the other person can just magically fix it for them and stuff like that, which I think mm -hmm. is, does a reasonably good job of balancing both the romance and the drama and stuff like that. Because, like, you know, a lot of other things, it's just, you know, they kiss and then credits roll, and it's like, oh, yeah, that fixed everything, problem solved and stuff. But here it's like, you got love interest. That kiss was like, earned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Also, speaking of which, they do kiss at the end, but they also kiss when they actually become love interests, yeah. right? When the, Yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, very earned kiss, though. Holy moly, she, he tried hard for that. But yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyways, though, yeah. But I would say that, like, while other games will potentially only confirm the love interest at the very end and then act like that fixes everything, here they introduce the love interest in the middle of the game. And yeah. while they don't necessarily emphasize it super hard, I appreciate the fact that, like, um, it makes it so that they can have both a relationship and also still have struggles at the end of the day because that's how real life works and whatnot, you know? And and yeah, while I would have probably appreciated if the love interest was, like, developed a little bit more, I, I mean, just the fact alone that we have a love interest that doesn't immediately end in death or credits rolling in a video game is <laughs> big plus, in my opinion. And um, she's her own character, like you said, with her own problems and, like, two adults, like, functioning in a very uh, understanding and... A supportive relationship who'd have thought in a video game i know yeah actually that was one other thing i forgot to mention in the overall narrative is the fact that like it's really refreshing to have an actual cast of grown but adults for once like i mean yeah i like teenagers but at the same time it gets a little old when like every single video game is about teenagers like you know on the cusp of their you know not knowing anything and yet being able to save the world and stuff and it's like you got some mature adults with mature problems it's like nice change of pace when they handle it all so well and stuff well, that's a good point to bring up as well, because you can, you know, in a lot of cases, I think if they're using a younger audience, they'll have to like scale up the story because or scale it back rather because they want they want them to engage in more serious topics, but they're like teenagers. And so, you know, your believability gets stretched a little bit, whereas here the challenge is actually harder because you are working with, with just adults and you are playing it really straight laced. So in order to make all of these things believable, like if you want a believable romance, if you want a believable sacrifice, if you want a believable, you know, betrayal, 
these these things are tough to pull off and it's got all of them it's got them in spades and it pulls them all off with flying colors so yeah it's really quite commendable the writing for this game Yep. Oh, and I would note for anyone watching, we did spoil some stuff about the story, but we definitely didn't spoil everything. And even the stuff we spoiled is better watched on your own. So don't let this be an excuse <laughs> to not go out and watch your own play because it's good stuff. Yeah, even if you're just going to watch like the visual novelization of it, where it just kind of takes all the scenes in between. I mean, they do play out differently depending on like how successful you were. There are some like slight changes. And like you said, the ending is different depending on which one you watch. But that just makes it worth a, worth a revisit. Yep. For sure, and yeah, my only minor tweaks with the with the missions, I think, I think mostly. Oh, that's right, there is. Yeah, yeah, most. You, you got it. You're, you're, you're right. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually did have one final point I wanted to mention about the uh, the narrative, because uh, we've kind of been touching upon it with the characters. So obviously, it has great characters. The writing is stellar for all three of them. So that alone uh, makes a big statement for it. But I would also say that it is a redemptive story, so it has a really nice closure to it. I like how it starts off where Maverick is just kind of in a rut. I mean, yeah, he's an ace pilot, but what good does that do you if nobody, you know, trusts you, if nobody wants to be your friend? And so as he's navigating all these different relationships and seeing all these different characters and you have Spirit's arc, you have Hobbs arc, you have his arc with Jeanette. And then, uh, you know, you get to the end and it, it, it just... And that, that's what I meant by like, it's so satisfying. It was just, it was such a gratifying ending to get to that final scene and be like, oh man, they made it. Like, that's awesome. Like he finally did the, he like he was doing the right thing and I was supporting him the whole way and he pulled it off. And it's just such a, it's such a cool story whenever you can see that happen. And it's not just like, like it's all icing on the cake, right? He doesn't need those things, but it is the kind of thing where, you know, he's like, it's had to suffer enough through this war. And like everybody has. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I thought that was just a really, I, I thought the ending was just pitch perfect. It was very, it had a very Oscarina feel, if I may. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I would say that like, you know, part of the problem, if you have stories that are like, you know, too saccharine or too low stakes is that when they do end up trying to make things all, you know, happy people in happy Valley, or whatnot, you know, it doesn't really land quite the same, but like when you got this game where they drag Maverick through every kind of mud and grime <laughs> possible, it's like, oh man, you get that happy ending and you're just cheering with all the other rest of the crowd and whatnot, like you did it Maverick, yeah, let's go, <laughs> you know? So yeah, very satisfying yeah. ending, I agree. All right. All right. Well, well, anything else you want to mention on Nerve, or you want to head off to a best pixel to wrap it all up? Let's do best pixel. Sounds great. So I would say, um, so aside from the categories it was nominating for, nominated for, uh, Wing Commander Two is still solid in most other aspects, which I, with I would say no major detracting factors in my opinion. For some minor weaknesses, I would say it's got hard to learn controls, which I mentioned earlier. Um, there's not a lot of variation in mission visuals and structures doing a due to being a space dogfighter, you know, I mean, it changes up some of the enemies that you fight and some of the, you know, you, you switch off the asteroids and minefields and stuff like that. But like, I don't know, by the end of the, the runtime, I would say they get a little bit repetitive, not horribly, but just a little bit and whatnot. Um, I would say there's the occasional moderate difficulty spike. Now, mind you, this is way better than in the first Wing Commander, which had some <laughs> terrible wing difficulty spikes. They smoothed it out a lot more, but still from a modern perspective, there's going to be some times where it seems like certain missions are significantly more difficult than, uh, you know, than others. Um, there's no exploration in the game, but that's not really what the game's going for. Just something to keep in mind if you're an exploration type person. Um, and I would say that the, the story and the gameplay are kept mostly separate. So you don't get too much of that fun gameplay storytelling synergy. It's still good story mm -hmm. and good gameplay, mm -hmm. but like since they're separate beasts, you kind of don't get to have that really fun interplay, I would say. Um, so yeah, I would say that that about sums it up for the other things I wanted to mention on Best Pixel. So you can take it away with any other points you want or tie it with the bow on top, Mitch. Yeah, uh, so I, I have this kind of uh, final phrase that I'm going to say for each of the best pixel winners. So it's kind of like an idea that sort of sums up everything that they have. Um, before I do that, uh, if you're curious to play Wing Commander 2 yourself, it and its prequel are on GOG at a reasonable price. Wing Commander oh, 2 oh. is up. So yeah, thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, we are also going to probably edit our audio over uh, YouTube footage from Rabbit Overlord. We got permission from them to uh, use their footage with this discussion, and we very much appreciate it. Feel free to check out their channel in order to 
see their Wing Commander 2 Let's Play along with the other videos that they have. Alrighty then. So uh, I think that sums it up. Wing Commander 2 is up for Best Pixel, Best Interface, Best Visual Immersion, Best Sound Atmosphere, two female character nominations for Angel and Spirit, as well as Hobbs for Best Male Character, and finally for Best Narrative Composition. If you're a voter, I hope you'll consider it, and if you are a viewer, let us know how you think it will perform. You can look forward to seeing the winners at the award ceremony this October. And to kind of cap it all off, since it's up for Best Pixel, if Wing Commander 2 wins Best Pixel, it will show an interest in cinematic storytelling, technical achievement, and the power of redemption.